to compare to compare the three different techniques for switching. We'll, I'll just try and summarize some things we know already using this diagram. Uh, remember, with switching is about the ways we deliver the data through a network. We send it via an, a number of intermediate nodes or switches, switching nodes, to form uh, a path from source to destination where that path takes uh, multiple links. And there are different approaches. The, the telephone network type approach is called circuit switching where we establish a circuit from source all the way through to destination via intermediate nodes before we send any data and then we transmit our data as a, a signal carrying that data. What these diagrams show for the three different switching cases for on the left is circuit switching, so if you don't recognise, write it on there. This one is circuit switching. The middle one is virtual circuit packet switching. And the right one is datagram packet switching. So three different approaches. With circuit switching, and all right, more about these diagrams. With these diagrams, they show an example of the timing for the three approaches in a case where we have three links. If you look at the bottom, node one, node one wants to send data to node four. In this example, there's a link to node two, three and four. So three links, four nodes involved, source is one, destination is four, the intermediate nodes are two and three. So this illustrates the timing of setting up the connection. It takes some time and then the transmission of data takes some time. So as a reminder with circuit switching what we do is when I want to send data to someone I first establish a circuit and that's shown at the top where I send a special signal from source 1 through to node destination node 4 here it's called a call request signal. So we often talk about a telephone call, sometimes a connection, a call request or a connection request. I send a signal to the first node along the path, node 2, sends it on to node 3 and then to the destination node 4 and that's when the destination, if they accept this request, they send back a special signal saying call is accepted. This is like you dial in someone's phone number and that sends a message to their phone. Their phone starts ringing when they pick up. The call accept message is sent back. Let's what, what that does is it sets up those intermediate nodes in preparation for the data transfer. So when node 2 receives the call request signal, node 2 knows that if I see an accept come back, that there's going to be data from node 1 to node 4. And what node 2 does is sets up the, the circuit between the link from node 1 to 2. So I think there's a cable from node 1 to node 2. And there's a cable from node 2 to node 3. So this call request triggers node 2 to effectively connect them together so that next time when the data comes on one of those cables it will go through that connection and go out on the other cable creating a circuit and the same happens at node 3 so in fact when the call accept comes back it reaches node 3 from node 4 the, this indicates that everything's okay 4 is happy to receive the data and it goes through node 3 to node 2 and back to node 1 and that's when the data can be sent. So we illustrate here, now node 1 transmits the data. And in circuit switching, think of it from a signal perspective. We establish a circuit, whatever the data, whether it's someone's voice, whether it's a file, but think of it from a signal, we transmit the data and the signal propagates across the first link. And because the circuit's set up, it effectively goes through node 2 and propagates across the second link through node 3 to the third link and reaches node 4. 
The result is we can now say that node 1 has a link all the way through to node 4. There's no physical link, it's made up of three different links, but from the perspective of the signal transmission, the signal just propagates from node 1 all the way through to node 4. And you see that nodes 2 and 3, when the data is transmitted, there's no delay inside those nodes. The signal just comes in, travels through a, a, a digital circuit, and then comes out onto the next link. And eventually, so it, in this example, it takes some time to transmit the data, and then eventually, because of propagation delay, the data is received at node 4. So let's say it was a large file transferred, takes time to transmit and propagate, we get the data. With, con with circuit switching, once we've transferred the data, once we're finished, we send back a response saying, we're finished, disconnect. So this acknowledgement signal saying that the data transfer is finished, three and two can disconnect. That is, they remove everything regarding this connection. They don't... Uh, if more data wants to come from node to four, they would need to set up again. Okay, so it's finished at this point. One thing we often care about, and this, this picture illustrates, is the timing and which one takes more time to transfer the same amount of data. So let's explain how the packet switching works, talk about the advantages and then look at the timing in this case. With packet switching, we take our data that we want to transfer and break it into smaller packets. The reason is, with circuit switching, once we establish a circuit, those links are reserved for that data transfer. No one else can use that. That's very wasteful if we reserve the link, but we don't transmit data. In this case, we're sending data, but in another case, we may send data, not disconnect, but then spend a time not sending data. All that time not spending data, maybe the computer at node 1 has got nothing to send, all of that time is wasting the links because they've been reserved for node 1 through to node 4. The idea with packet switching, both of these approaches, is that we split the data into smaller chunks, send them one at a time, and if it gets... When we have multiple users sending data, if at a particular link we have little data coming from one user, one user's got nothing to send, so they've got no packets coming in, then we'll be able to send packets from another user. So with many users in the network, some are, some are sending a lot, some are sending little, and it changes over time, then on average what it works out if we design the network correctly is that for links, those links can carry the packets of different users at different times and be much more efficient. With circuit switching, we reserve that resource just for that pair of users. With packet switching, we can use that resource amongst multiple pairs of users. And that works well when we have applications that generate data which vary a lot. When you're, you've got your mobile phone running, there's always services in the background, your instant messaging service, uh, your updates are always sending packets, but not continuously. Maybe they send some packets over a short period of time and then send nothing. And then a little bit later send some packets and then nothing. If we had a circuit switch connection to send those packets, it'd be very wasteful because what would happen is your mobile phone would set up a connection, have it running all day, but maybe only 10% of the time would it be sending packets. With packet switching, you just send the packet when you need to send it. And internal, internally in the network, if you're not sending packets, the network can deliver someone else's packets. And that's much more efficient. We've got two different variations of packet switching. Datagram packet switching, this one on the right, and the one in the middle is virtual circuit packet switching. The name suggests we use packets and they have the advantage of being more efficient because we don't reserve the entire set of resources, but we try and have the similar behaviour to circuit switching, virtual circuit it's called, in that we set up a connection, 
then send our packets. This is, has an advantage in that by setting up a connection you prepare the nodes in advance for receiving the data. So we'll see in datagram packet switching there's no connection set up at the top, we just send the data. In datagram packet switching, node 2 doesn't know before it receives packet 1 that the data is coming. It has no idea that there's data coming from node 1 until it receives the actual data. But with virtual circuit packet switching, node 2 knows from the call request packet and call accept packet that in the future node 1 is going to send data to node 4 via node 2. That's a benefit in that node 2 can, can prepare, okay, make sure it has some memory available. It can do more advanced things like give priority to users. I want to make a voice call to someone using virtual circuit packet switching. I set up a connection and when I set up the connection it tells nodes 2 and 3 give priority to Steve's voice call. And then someone else makes a virtual circuit packet switching connection and they don't pay as much as me to the network operator so their packets get lower priority. My packets get higher priority and I get better performance. That's much easier with virtual circuit packet switching than with datagram packet switching. So the concept of informing the intermediate nodes in advance can be a benefit in that case. Other than that, they both send packets. In this simple example, just three packets to contain the data, but in a more complex example it may be a large number or even a very small number, one packet. And importantly, with the packets, what happens, we transmit a packet across the first link. Node 2 will transmit that same packet across the second link only once it's received it in its entirety. And you see that here. This is the transmission time for packet 1. It propagates. Packet 1 is fully received here. So Node 2 has got the packet. Maybe it does some checking, error detection, checks the destination address and then sends it on to node 3. So you see this delay here, transmit packet 1, then transmit it again and then transmit it again. Whereas with, so nodes 2 and 3 are active in this case, whereas in circuit switching nodes 2 and 3 effectively do nothing other than let the signal go through to the, the next link. So nodes 2 and 3 do much more in this case and therefore they must receive and then send the packet and therefore it takes more time. What else can we say? From these pictures, which, so often we care about the timing, how long it takes to transfer the data. Before we get into that, which one is the easiest? Which one looks the easiest from the node's perspective? This one is easy once we've set up a connection, especially from node 2 and 3. They do nothing effectively. So once we set up a connection, this is easy. Whereas datagram packet switching is easy because we don't set up a connection. It's harder for the processing of the packets, yes, for the data transfer, but one advantage it has is that there's no concept of a connection, just send the data. The problem with setting up a connection is that the intermediate nodes need some, some memory and some capacity to, to allocate for that. So we need to tell node 2 and need, node 2 needs to remember that there's going to be data from node 1 to node 4. Sounds easy, a small amount of memory, but now think when you have you know, hundreds of thousands of voice calls or millions of packets per second going through particular devices, then the amount of memory needed for all of these connections can be significant. So this one's simple in terms of no connection, but packet switching requires more 
processing of the data at the intermediate nodes, whereas circuit switching doesn't here. Circuit switching is no good for our applications we use today. It's very inefficient for variable, uh, for applications that send at a variable rate, that don't constantly send but just send for a short amount and then send nothing. So circuit switching is not used for most of our applications today. What else can we see? Um, circuit switching is inefficient for data applications, internet applications. It's good for performance, okay, guaranteed performance, but that leads to inefficiencies. Packet switching requires some more processing at the intermediate nodes, two and three, but much better for applications with uh, vary, varying sending rates, like in most applications we use today. And still works well for uh, voice and video calls, for example. Most networks built today uh, use packet switching. We'll, we'll talk more about that at the end. A bit more about the timing. Let's see. We care about how long it takes to transfer the data. Same picture. I'll just make some notes on it so you can see. So from the user's perspective, the user, let's say, at this point in time, they press start. Whatever application they're using, whether they're making a voice call, transferring a file, at this time they start the transfer. And then that triggers the call request signal, the call accept. Then the data transfer begins here. And at this point in time, the data transfer is finished. Node 4 has received it. And we're done. We often care about the time between the two red dots. Okay? From when the user presses start, let's say you want to transfer a file from one node 1 to node 4 at this time until when the data is received. We want to know how long that takes. Or when we compare the three approaches, which one's best? Sometimes we'll also compare, okay, how long does it take to transfer the same amount of data, ig ignoring the setup the, between the two green dots? Now, in the two sw circuit switching approaches, circuit switching and virtual circuit packet switching, there's also some message saying we've finished the data transfer. That's needed. We can't avoid that. But from the user's perspective, often we don't care how long that takes. That's needed in the network, but the user here has already received the data. So it's not so important from the timing perspective. So now let's compare the three from those two perspectives of total time plus the data transfer from the start until when the last piece of data is received. Which one takes the least time? In this example, datagram packet switching finishes first. It takes the least time. Is that always true? This is an example, okay, so is it always true? Why not? Under what conditions did that not be true? Why does it take less time here? What are some of the reasons that it takes least time, the, less, the least time in these three examples? It doesn't check if the packets can be received. Uh, sort of. Uh, well, none of these, well, in all of these, we haven't worried about whether the packet is uh, correct or not. But yes, it doesn't, it doesn't inform the destination that we're about to transfer data and whether we're, the destination already received data. Okay. That is, don't think that this is an acknowledgement for reliability. This is maybe the acknowledgement is a bad name here. This is saying I'm finished. Okay, no more data. 
that's all. But you see, I think, there's no connection set up. I generally call this to set up a connection or set up a call. There's no initial exchange. So we bypass that time. That takes time to get a message there and get one back. So datagram packet switching never has that initial start-up time. How long is that initial start-up time? Well, that depends upon the propagation delays, the number of links and so on. But, uh, so that would depend. So that's an advantage of datagram packet switching. Whenever you have data, just send it. You don't have to wait for the initial setup. And it, consider two extreme cases there. What if there was just one packet of data to send? Well, right here we have three. If there was one, right, we transmit one, one and one, we get it here. Compare with virtual circuit packet switching with just one packet of data. The process is send a packet to request, wait for the ACK or the call accept packet to get back, and then send out one packet of real data. So really there's, across our network, there are three exchanges to get the one packet of real data. We need to send the request, get the accept, and then send our real data. So it really takes three times as much time as just sending the real data straight away. So that's where it's very inefficient to set up a connection when you only have a small amount of data to send it's wasteful of time. You might as well just send the data. It would be much faster. If you have, at the other extreme, a million packets here, and I ask you to draw that, keep drawing a million packets, then you, I think you can imagine packet three, four, five, and it'll keep going down. With a large amount of data, this initial request and accept time is going to be quite small compared to the total time. So if you've got a large amount of data to transfer, then setting up a connection is not a big problem. It's okay. Because it's only a small part of the total time. But if you've only got a small amount of data to transfer, then setting up a connection is a large amount of the total time. And therefore you may not want to wait that time. So that's one comparison there. Uh, what about between the two green dots here, the time to trans transfer the user data with circuit switching versus the others, packet switching? That is, between the green dots. And if you look at between the green dots for the two switching techniques, it's the same. So between packet switching and circuit switching, which one takes less time for just the tr transfer of data? This one is less. Okay. The way that circuit switching works is that we don't packetize the data, we don't split it up, we just transmit it all at once. Okay. Assuming we've got data to send, of course, then we just transmit the data and we can think this is the transmission time and the data or the signal carrying the data propagates across those three links. There's no processing in nodes two or three. Whereas with packet switching, we transmit one packet, then the second, then the third. Each packet usually has a header. So there's some overhead there. Maybe it's not shown in this diagram, but each packet has the data plus a header. We need a header so that the nodes know where to send it. A header is not needed for the data in circuit switching because we know that the data is going to go through to node 4. So there's an extra overhead with headers plus with some processing at intermediate nodes. Node 2 receives packet 1. It must wait until it's received in full and then send on to, packet, uh, on to node 3. So there's that time waiting there. So you see that packet switching, just the data transfer part, is always longer than circuit switching. 
So which one takes the longest time? Well, it depends. It depends on how much data to transfer, the propagation delay, the number of links and so on. But in general, if you've got a large amount of data, then setting up a connection is OK. But if you've only got a small amount of data, then setting up a connection is, is wasteful of time. I think we'll, we'll stop our summary. Uh, uh, there's a couple of other things about packets, but stop our comparison of the three. Maybe in practice, where are they used? When you use networks, do you, do you use any of these three? Where do, you, where do you use networks every day? What two main networks do you, do you use? The, that, that I word, what's the I word? That network that covers the international area? The internet? You use the internet every day? That, think of, the internet's a network. It's actually a network of many networks. It uses datagram packet switching. Okay, so th there's an example. In the internet, it's built upon the concept of datagram packet switching. It doesn't set up a connection, so some applications may set up a connection, but in, that's specific to applications, but for everything sent in the internet, it, then it's based upon datagram packet switching. It's very simple. There's no initial setup. It works well. doesn't matter if you're sending one byte of data or one million bytes of data. There's no overhead of setting up the connection and there's no, no extra requirements of the processing or especially the memory of setting up the connection. So it makes the nodes relatively simple. So that's why, one reason why the internet has become so successful compared to other technologies uh, which are around which use different approaches. Does anyone use, anyone here use circuit switching? Telephone. Your mobile phone even uses circuit switching. Okay. You use your mobile phone for two purposes, for making phone calls and for internet access. In fact, for making phone calls on your mobile phone, it still uses circuit switching. So it, it connects to the, the landline telephone network using circuit switching. But when you send with internet access on your mobile phone, it will use packet switching then. Okay. Newer mobile phone technologies, so fourth generation or 4G technologies, are switching to using packet switching even for your voice calls. So everything is basically over the internet. But I think the current technologies here are still using circuit switching for your voice calls. But most networks are moving to packet-based networks. It works much better for a variety of applications. That's, I think, enough summary of the three different approaches. There are a few more words on this table that compares them. You may have a look through, but I think what we've said today and in the previous lecture is enough. There's some things that we haven't covered here which we will not go into. Any questions on the three different switching techniques? Can we move on? We've got one slide that we want to cover which is about packet switching but it is a nice concept that is relevant for networks which not so much for links. This slide we skipped over. This is another aspect of how long it takes to transfer data with packet switching just focusing on the data transfer part, not the connection set up. And this will try and illustrate the trade-offs involved with the packet size. In general, how big should a packet be? What's the advantage of having a big or a small packet? 
Do we want big or small? Medium. Why would you not want a big packet? Right, if you send big packets, then if you lose one, you lose it all. You, you have to retransmit a lot. So that's a bad for big packets. Anything else? Why would you want small packets? Oh, sorry, uh, why would you not want small packets? So you say you don't want big packets because of retransmission, so let's make the packet one byte. That's the smallest we can go. What's the problem? It takes more time to transmit all the packets because I have, let's say, a, a packet contains a one byte of data. Each packet contains one byte of data versus a packet that contains a thousand bytes of data. One byte, small packet. One thousand bytes, big packet. And I have a thousand bytes of data to send. Which approach takes more time? Small. Smaller packet because of the header. the header. Okay, so the header, and in practice the header is usually something we cannot control. We can choose the size of the data, but we usually can't control the size of the header. So the smaller the data inside each packet, the, the more header that we need to transmit for the same amount of total data. So we'd like large packets for that reason. Okay, forgetting about errors for a moment. So, with just regarding headers, we want large packets. We'll go through four different cases, uh, and I'll give you the numbers so we can make some a, a little bit more, more realistic. And we'll look at when we're sending packets across a network. Another factor that comes into play. You have on the slide, the situation we have is what this, this picture illustrates is we have uh, a scenario of node X has a link to node A, then to B, then to Y. You see that on the slide down the bottom. Node X to A to B to Y. So we have an, a path with three links. We want to send data from X to Y. Let's say the total data we want to send, total original data is 1,250 bytes. And let's say the link data rate of all links is 8 megabits per second. Every link is the same. Why, why do I choose these numbers? How long does it take to transmit 1,250 bytes? Someone can calculate transmission time. At 8 megabits per second, how long does it take to transmit 1250 bytes? Data size divided by data rate. Tell me the answer in microseconds. Micro times by a thousand. If you have 1,250 bytes times by 8 to give bits is 10,000. It turns out to be 1,250 microseconds. So that's why I chose a data rate of 8 megabits per second, just so that the data size and the data transmission time are the same number, just for this example.
a data packet is made up of header plus original data. Sometimes we call it payload. But this is the original data. So we can say a data packet contains header plus payload or header plus data. Just another word is payload. In this example, let's say the header is 100 bytes. It's fixed. We can't change it. what we're going to do is try four different scenarios with a different payload. The first one will set it to be a payload of 1,250 bytes. The second one will be half the size. Third one will be 250 bytes. And the last one, 125. Any questions? Everyone can calculate transmission time. So we, we'll go through the four different cases. That is, we want to look at if we use different payload, a different size packet, same size header but a different amount of data in each packet, the total amount of data we want to send is 1,250 bytes. So by changing the payload, we'll get a different number of packets. We want to see how that impacts upon the, the total time to transfer. Now, for simplicity, we're going to ignore any processing and propagation delays. Okay, so propagation is zero. Processing is zero. We could do the same if we had them. So, the diagram on the left we'll go through first. What it shows is the transmission of the data packet from X to A across the first link and then from A to B here and the last part is from B to Y. How many packets do we need to transmit? not looking at the diagram, but looking at the total data and the payload size, how many data packets do we need? Hands up. Hands up for one. Hands up for not one. Oh, everyone except one person is correct. Okay, it's one. Total data is 1,250 bytes. In each data packet, I'm going to include a payload of 1,250 bytes. So, we need just one packet. Okay. In the second case, we'll go through in a moment, is total data is 1,250 bytes, but I'm only going to send 625 bytes per packet. Therefore, I'll need two packets. I need to transfer the total amount of data, same amount of data, but I'm going to do it in smaller chunks. So, I think you will see in a moment, but in the first example, we're going to need one packet. In the second example, two packets. Total data, 1250 divided by 250, this would need five packets. And this one will need 10 packets. Packet. PKT, short for packet. Now let's look at the, the transmission time. In the first case, I think we start at time zero. At what time is the header transmitted? If we start at zero, how long does it take to transmit the header? <coughs> how big is the header? In the, the setup, how big was the header? How many bytes? 
100 bytes, good. And how long will that take to transmit? 100 microseconds. You can calculate, but the way that I've chosen 8 megabits per second, the transmission time will be the same number, of course a different unit, but same number as the, the number of bytes. Just to make it easy for you to calculate. And me. So if we start at time 0, the header would finish at time 100, but then we transmit the payload, which takes what? Another 1,250. So we'd finish here at 1,350 microseconds. That is, one data packet is 1,350 bytes in length. Transmitting at 8 megabits per second means it takes 1,350 microseconds to transmit. So this is from X to A, the first link. And when A receives that, it can then transmit that same data packet onto B. The aim is to get the data from X to Y via A and B. So as soon as we receive that, we start transmitting that same data packet to B. What time does B receive? Again, another 100, another 100 plus 1250, it's, it's another 1350, brings us to 2700. It's the same size. And then when B receives, it transmits to Y. And it receives it another 1350. 4050. Each data packet takes 1,350 microseconds to transmit and we transmit from A, uh, sorry, from X to A, the first one. When A's received it, it transmits on to B. When B's received it, it transmits on to Y. And then we're done. We care about this total time. We want to see which one's faster and why. Let's try the second case where we have a smaller packet, half the size, and we need to send, of course, two packets in this case. So start at time zero, transmit the header, finish 725. That is 625 for the payload, 100 for the header. We've got the fixed size header in all cases. What happens next? What does this picture show us what's happening? And who transmits what next? Data 2. So focusing on the source node X, X has two data packets to send. And the way the X transmits, it transmits data packet 1 and then pa packet 2. So that's what we see here. Data 1 being transmitted and then data 2 being transmitted. When will data 2 arrive? Maybe if we, this time, well another 725. But what's also happening, remember what this diagram shows, in the first part is what X transmits to A, then in the second part is what A transmits to B. They have separate links. So while A is receiving data packet 2, it's also transmitting data packet 1 onto B. And because they're the same length, it ar arrives at the same time here. We've got something happening in parallel here. 
with, with the two links in our network, from A's perspective, it's receiving data two on one link from one cable and on the other cable, it's transmitting data one at the same time. That's what this diagram shows here. Follow that on because each data packet takes 725. Receive here, what is it? Receive data 2 by B at 2175. At the same time, Y receives data 1 and then a little bit later receives data 2. What is it? 2,900. Which, which of the two is faster? We see the second one is faster. The first one took 4,050 microseconds. The second one takes 2,900. Why? We've got smaller packets in the second case, therefore more header being sent. No errors, we're ignoring errors. Why do we get better? I think most people can see it somewhere, but describe it. What, what's happening that saves us time? 2,900 versus 4,050, we've saved over 1,000 microseconds, sending the same amount of data by just sending it in smaller packets. So here's smaller packets, faster. Why? What, what's happening? How do you describe what's happening? Can send packets in the network at the same time. Something's happening in parallel. Think of we're receiving some and at the same time transmitting. It's possible because uh, we have separate links. At this point in time, X is transmitting one packet to A, but at the same time, A is transmitting the packet to B. Maybe back to the top, that's like uh, that we're sending X to A, but at the same time, A to B. So that's happening in parallel. And that saves us out, saves us time in total. So we're utilising the network much better in this case. We're, we're transmitting on two links at the same time. Whereas in the first case, at any one time, we're only using one link. We're either using the first link or the second or the third. This one we get to use two links at the same time. Follow it through for the third case. Five packets. We'll not write them all. Zero. This will be 350 because 100 for the header, 250 for the data. So just look at the number of packets in total. One, two, three, four, five. Then the time to transmit that last packet from A to B and then from B to Y. So a total of seven transmissions. Not through the network, but in terms of uh, happening over time, it's the equivalent of seven transmission times. What do you get? Seven times 2340. 2340. Why did I say that? I thought that was the answer. Seven times 350. 2450. It's even better. Why is it better? Yeah. 
we get some cases where we can be using all three links at the same time. So in these periods, the link from X to A is being utilised, the link from A to B is being utilised for sending packet 4 and at the same time the link from B to Y is being utilised to send packet 3. So that's better because we can save total time. Smaller packet, smaller total time. Try the fourth case. Ten packets, 100 bytes of header, 125 bytes of data, a total of 225. Transmit 10 packets plus the time for the 10th to get to B and the time for the 10th to get to Y, so a total of 12 transmissions. 12 times 225 is 2,700. Which one's best? Number three in, in, out of these four. Okay, th that best in that it takes less time. Same amount of data delivered, less time. Why? Because, well, in the first two, we were better than those two because we utilised the links better we had enough packets to be able to be using all three links at the same time. You can see that look say at, at this time period in this case there's one, tr one link being used, here there's two links being used, here there are three links, all three links being used, here there's all three links being used. There's no more than three links that can be used at the same time. What's wrong with number four? Too much header. Because the packets are so small, well, the header is almost as large as the, the data. Right, so we've got, we've got packets that are too small, it means we transmit too much header to make up for the advantage of transmitting across all links. So now ignoring errors and other reasons, packet size in a network, here we're seeing larger packets to reduce headers but smaller packets to utilise the links better. And you, that leads to a trade-off or finding an optimal solution. The idea is that generally we want to use large packets to reduce the impact of headers. Okay. Large packets are good because then headers are less. But we want small packets so that we can be transmitting them on all links at the same time. In the first case, with a large packet, we only had one packet to send. So there was no chance to be sending that one packet uh, or to send packets on the three links at the same time because they have to go one after the other. How do you know how many links? You need to know something about the network. So this is just one example with three links. So this is just showing a, a specific case of, of the trade-offs. If there are four links, it would be a different best size. Okay. If, if the header size was not 100 bytes but 50 bytes and so on, that we'd have to calculate. We're just showing the trade-off.
Any questions on this issue of packet size on our, in our network now? So different, different uh, technologies will often specify the maximum packet size allowed. And people have designed and come up with the, what they think is, should be is the biggest size that gives a good trade-off between all the different factors of errors, of buffer sizes, of using the links, of keeping the header small. Uh, there are different trade-offs to consider. And it, many protocols will say your packet cannot be larger than this size. It can be smaller, but the maximum is usually given. The headers we usually cannot control. We can control how much data, we may vary that, but not the header. 